is only a conjecture, but as a humble experimental physicist, I'm convinced it's true without the need for proof. When he came to Stony Brook in 1988, he was, of course, immediately appointed to State University of New York, distinguished professor. In that nomination letter for the position, it was written, Professor Milner is one of the great mathematicians of this, the 20th century. With the clarity of mind and depth of perception rarely seen, he has changed the landscape of mathematical thought. He has worked in a wide variety of fields and made fundamental contributions to each. Some of these rank with the greatest mathematical discoveries of the age. All of them bear his particular mark of genius. At Stony Brook, we do a lot of mathematics, and we're very, very proud of our department. The university is obviously very proud and very pleased to have had Jack here for more than 10 years, leading our Institute for Mathematical Sciences. I wish you all a very great conference. Jack, congratulations on your birthday again, and congratulations on everything. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so this title has a string in it, so uh, so I'm going to give a kind of string topology or string mathematics. I'm going to give a kind of provisional to definition, which just means so you 
you use, you know, arcs or circles in, in place of points. So, for example, in dynamics, uh, you generally have like some dynamical system, some space, some transformation, and, and often one studies the orbit. And according to this yoga, one should also take, you know, arcs and, and, and map them, or circles and map them. And, uh, and actually, I'm going to give a couple of more slightly more concrete examples than that as sort of an example. Uh, and, but then I'm going to move into a more algebraic aspect of what this implies. So I apologize a little bit. This talk is going to be kind of algebraic. Uh, uh, OK, so, so first, um, uh, in dynamics, there was this um, a mini revolution about 20, 25 years ago uh, when it was realized that uh, after the general theory uh, of so-called hyperbolic dynamical systems, one could make a lot of progress in low dimensions with dynamical systems that illustrated very rich bifurcation structure. And, it turned, and one surprisingly complicated but fruitful example was just a folding mapping where you had, you take a line and you just map it over itself like that. So you, this is a picture of the mapping of the lines of the cell. And if you iterate this, you fold it again, you know, it looks like that, say. And then you do it again. I don't know if I can draw the next one. Well. <laughs> Oops. Well, there's a line with, yeah, here. Well, I don't know if that's right. But anyway, so you keep folding it, and uh, and now, of course, the so it's the idea of Milner. It's in the Milner, it's the Thurston paper that the, the you can measure the complexity of this original mapping by counting how many folds there are, and you see that the structure of the folding depends on you know some point is folded. This point here goes to that point, and it sort of depends, you know, whether when you do this, the fold lies here or lies here, or it could lie here or here or here. So there's sort of a combinatorial structure that is natural to look at. And this actually was described in this classic paper of some combinatorics, which is called the needing sequence. You know, suggests the idea of the needing bread when you fold bread. And this is a very beautiful combinatorial pattern. And it has a complexification, which is the Mandelbrot set, and uh, which we're going to hear about in this conference. But and the point I wanted to make, why is it related to string in the mathematics? You see, this pattern that you see, even though it can be described in terms of iterating points, you can, it turns out you can describe everything by just watching the orbit of this point. But somehow it's extremely natural to see this pattern as the perform the mapping as a string. I mean, here's the string and you perform the mapping and you see how the string goes and you've naturally led to this to think about this structure. So even though this is kind of a very tiny example, this, this point of view, so to speak, is used here, you could say. If you didn't know what to do, you could guess what to do by thinking about it as a string and, and mapping it as a string. See, there's another beautiful example. I mean, there's another, there's another example which I think is beautiful. Uh, uh, there are these surface transformations. Uh, this was an idea of Thurston. Actually, he had this idea when he was a graduate student. Surface, here's a surface, and the surface has lots of uh, complicated curves on it, which are actually embedded. And there's a basic transformation called the Dane twist. I'll draw it as a simple curve, where you take a curve, you cut the surface, you twist it around 2 pi, and you glue it back. Now, if you iterate that, that's a very simple structure. But if you sort of compose the Dane twist around that curve with the Dane twist around some other curve, actually, when you compose Dane twist like this, you get all of the possible deformation classes of surface transformations. Anyway, if you compose a couple of Dane twists along curves that intersect, you 
you generate a complicated dynamics and Thurston as a graduate student was trying to figure out how they looked like and he had the idea of studying how it acted on the fundamental group so instead of how it acts on points and so you take another closed curve so you have some transformation of the surface I've just described the building blocks of the general transformation up to deformation and then you take a closed curve any other like a rubber band and you start applying the transformation and you see if the curve you're doing crosses through this area where you have the Dane twist it gets twisted around like that and then when you do the other Dane twist it'll get twisted around this one if it crosses here so if you take a curve that sort of looks like I don't know like like this say and so it should go around the back here and so it's forced to cut and then you start to iterate this each time you do a Dane twist it'll get longer and longer and now these are always homeomorphism and this curve which is embedded gets longer and longer and it still has to live on the surface so it gets longer and longer and it, it develops these strands I mean if you do this like a thousand times this curve is you know two to the thousand long or something and then you you have to place it on the surface as an embedded so that it's very long so you're starting to draw it on the surface and you're drawing it well if you've already drawn these parts and you're drawing the new part it can't cross because it's an embedded curve so it has to keep going in between and you start seeing a, a picture of parallel strands and Thurston made this beautiful theory that the limits of curves under a general transformation converge to a sort of foliation on the surface and you see it's a it's you know it's just a tribute is some kind of a, a banal tautology that you know a, a long embedded curve on a surface looks like a foliation and then he calculated the limiting objects uh, geometrically and, and he, he calculated how many parameters it would take to describe it you just take you know you have to, have to take parallel pieces and sort of glue them together as a natural way and he found there were 6g minus 7 parameters which is the genus and makes a sphere dimension 16 minus 7 and then suddenly it's the boundary of Teichmuller space and there's a big beautiful theory so <clears throat> although that's not I mean I would say that's another example of string mathematics where you you get a really good image uh, of what to do from uh, mapping this in the string forward so uh, Let's see now, going back to this, this, the next thing I want to say is related to uh, complex dynamics, which is, this is one complex variable, this, so there's going to be a lot of talks uh, in this conference about one complex variable. And uh, first of all, in this example here, the interesting, you can, you can realize all these combinatorial possibilities but you just take this family of quadratic maps and vary A. You can realize all possible all the combinatorial possibilities are realized there. And then and then a lot of other uh, questions you can ask about this and it turned out it was very useful to complexify uh, this map and it was a beautiful concept of a complex folding map invented by uh, Hubbard and Duadi, Duadi and Hubbard, where you actually have a disk and, the, and then you have a, an analytic map that maps the disk around twice. The boundary goes outside of itself. And when you study the sort of complex in the dating sequence, you get this Mandelbrot set, and you bury this around. And uh, anyway, uh, so using complex methods uh, has led to a fruitful development, and a lot of that activity has been taking place at. Uh, uh, the uh, Institute for Math Sciences, the Milner directs these. And today I wanted to talk about, uh, well, another another kind of string point is, it kind of comes up now, but I'm kind of switching order of things, is that, well, I, well, let me just say it and then I'll come back to it. I can't justify it continuously, but, you know, Complex analysis is a, is a great field, but one, com one dimensional complex analysis is somehow particularly uh, 
gifted in terms of endowed in terms of what it's been able to do. And I think the reason, one reason is that you can make a picture. And this idea of the surface, so the, the, the picture of a surface spreading over itself is like a complex analog of a string spreading over itself. And you can do so much with that p picture beyond the formulas and the analysis that this one-dimensional complex variables is a very complicated, a very uh, good field. And I sort of feel it's, it's, it's true because of the same reason this is so clear, it's sort of a sort of complex string. But anyway, so I, today I wanted to talk about another uh, way in which uh, uh, complex uh, analysis in the form of Riemann surfaces uh, is related to dynamics. And I'm just, I'm going to just mention in very, uh, you know, one sentence, so to speak, the relationship I'm referring to, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I believe that uh, the last talk of this conference by Ilya Osberg will give a lot more information about this point, so I'll only just say the smallest thing here, and that is that if you consider flows on the three-sphere, the three-dimensional sphere and a flow, a dynamical system, which is continuous time on the three-sphere, then uh, there was the question of whether or not you always had to have periodic orbits. And uh, it was found that you don't have to. And there were some famous counterexamples. And even for volume preserving, there are uh, counterexamples. And volume preserving flow has a property that almost every orbit is recurrent. So it's hard to avoid having periodic orbits. But then there's a special kind of volume preserving diffeomorphism called the contact diffeomorphism. I won't just. I'll skip saying what it is. It's just sort of twisting property, you might say. Everything is twisting in one direction. Uh, and it was recently, or I don't know exactly the time, it was recently shown that every contact diffeomorphism on the three sphere uh, has a periodic orbit. And that uses this new technique here. And so let me, uh, let me, no, 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 let me, so that's the introduction. And then we start the talk proper. So, so let's go back to this string mathematics. Uh, and, and the theory is, the theory that uh, underlies this technique uh, has a strong existence in quantum field theory. And the algebra I'm going to discuss now is related to what one a mathematician can try to learn by studying uh, those ideas. So, uh, so the first, so we go back to, so, so let's go back to the, the idea of, of let's imagine uh, an evolving string. Just vague sense. So we have, let's take a closed string too big, or evolving strings, maybe have even a collection. So we imagine it's moving through, it's moving in time through some space, so we would sort of sweep out a cylinder, but then we want to allow strings to interact, and so like this point of this string could hit this point of this string, and come together, and then you can make one string out of the two. This will go on like this, and so if you think of a, a general kind of evolution of strings where not only are the strings moving by some geometric motion, but also you have this reconnecting. So, uh, so the reconnecting is like this, preserving the orientation. Imagine two strings touch so that, say, they're directed, and when they touch, the tangent directions are pointing in opposite directions and then you, you perform this, so that then you get a directed string. Then what is led to uh, make a space, so if and this is happening in some like three manifold, and then we'd have time, we'd have some four manifold, that would be the uh, context for this great theorem I just referred to over here. Then, <clears throat> so we're led to consider 
Um, and actually, uh, we're, we're sort of led to consider all mappings of surfaces into some space time. So this is just, I'm going to call this X. So for me, this is just a, a D manifold. So X always stands for a D manifold, which I think of as space time because it's it's the track of the of the evolving string. So the surface is the track of the evolving string. So we want to make some algebra out of that. Go over algebra. Uh, of course, I could draw another thing. Of course, this could go along, and the string can intersect itself and then break into two. The reverse thing. <coughs> So we consider all maps of, let's say, um, and so if, if I actually thought of a space time where I had, the, I had a boundary, and these were two times, I would want to consider maps of surfaces with boundary into a manifold with boundary where the boundary goes in the boundary. And also there's a, another point, you could also have sub-manifolds of other dimensions and consider maps like this too, where the boundaries in the sub-manifold. Anyway, so we want to take all of them. Now to, in order to save a little time, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk more about the case when there's no boundary. So I'm just going to talk about maps of all surfaces, all maps of all surfaces. So the surfaces are organized by the genus, the sphere, the torus, the genus 2 surface. And uh, into my space-time X. I want to discuss this. <clears throat> um, and then I'll, I'll get back to the context where this theory uh, uh, lives. Um, so, and what I'm going to concentrate on is an algebraic structure in here, which uh, one learns from studying the, some of the algebra of, of quantum field theory. So, okay. So, a little, a little more formally, I'm going to consider all maps of a, of a surface genus G into X could look like that, and I want to. I assume I have some distinguished points as well on the surface. This is a familiar thing to do. And I want to actually suppose that these are Riemann surfaces. So I actually have a complex structure on, the, on, the, on this surface. And, but the map doesn't do anything. It's just all, say, smooth maps. It doesn't do anything with respect to the complex structure. Because this is just a smooth manifold. It doesn't have any additional structure at the moment. And I want the order characteristic of uh, the surface minus those points to be the negative. And then I'm going to identify two such maps if there's a conformal equivalence between the Riemann surfaces that makes the diagram commute. So that's sort of my space of objects. And now I don't do analysis on that space. I want to do, I want to do algebra. So actually, I want to take families. I want to consider families of maps. Like you have some finitely many parameters with finitely many parameters of, of these equivalence classes. And the families are going to be used in the sense of algebraic topology, so I want them to be uh, or oriented families. And so these, and so I'm going to take linear combinations of oriented families of maps. Maps are put, they're not exactly maps, they're more like the image because I took this equivalence relation. Linear combinations of oriented families. So these are called chains in algebraic topology. And if you have a, you know, if you have a, like a, a one dimensional family, uh, you can look at the boundary and you get a zero dimensional family. If you have for two-dimensional family, you break it up somehow, you can get a boundary, which is a one-dimensional family. So the, there's a linear operator, which is the 
boundary operator of, of algebraic topology on these fa families. So a little more formally, uh, a family is a, uh, you have to have a family of surfaces above your parameter space and then a map of the total space A into X. And then you extend this equivalence relation like that. This, this could have some little twist in it, so it kind of comes out of this uh, equivalence relation. Okay, so this has some interesting structure, uh, this whole thing. So for example, uh, well, first of all, it's a, a graded vector. Well, it has two indices, the genus and the number of distinguished points, and then the dimension of the family. So we actually have a graded vector space with a boundary operator. Call this MI, standing for moduli space of maps into X, MI of X, have a boundary operator. And the union of all these things is actually uh, an algebra. You can make and let m be m be the direct sum, and you can make an algebra structure on m. It's an algebra using disjoint union. So if you have two maps, if you have a map of one surface, map of another surface, you can take the map on the union and. Uh, with the right conventions, this becomes a uh, rated commutative uh, algebra. Because you use the chain and you have signs, so you can get some sign in there. So you have a natural rated commutative algebra where the algebra structure corresponds to disjoint unit. The dimension of the family, the I chain. Huh? Well, you have three gradings, actually. This is the geometric grading on the chain, and then you have the two indices, the genus and the number of distinguished points. It's like the dimension, if you have an i-dimensional family, so like this is a one-dimensional family, so it's like an arc, and over each point of the arc you have a surface, and then you have a map of the total space into x. Right? So this is algebra. So this is all kind of for free. This would be true for any space x. Now we're going to use the fact it's a manifold for the next piece of structure. And I'm, I want to say that, uh, well, this is related to two things. First of all, it's related to a paper that uh, Maura Chass and I wrote called String Topology. And I'll give you the, the reference. Uh, this next step, but it's also related to uh, some papers of Barton Schwebach, who's a physicist. And also, it's related to, with the final stage, is to some conversations I've had in a paper of you know, with Billy Oshberg and a paper he has with Gibbenthal and Hoffer. So anyway, all these things I'm just trying to, this is like the elephant, you know, <laughs> just different pieces of the elephant, <laughs> different aspects of the elephant. <clears throat> so it's really, they're all completely disjoint aspects of the same thing. So, uh, so the next thing now uses, so far this is just any space and, you know, it's continuous maps, there's no, it's very formal. But now we do, now we do something more interesting. If, if X is a manifold, so now this is a picture of X. So now let's let's say we have here's the domain of one family of maps, and then we have the domain of some other So you can sort of pick attention and look at one of these actually look at one of the distinguished points in one family and a distinguished point in the other family. You have all these maps. So then you have nine maps of the union. It's the Cartesian product. You have a lot of maps of the union. And then in there, you can look for the sublocus where this point coincides with that point. So, you know, the thing looks like this. These two points actually kiss one another. 
and that'll be a certain sub-locus. It'll, this is imposing, if your manifold is dimension D, this will be imposing D constraints. So this, by transversality, this would be a family of dimension nine minus D. You're imposing D constraints. Okay, so then, now this is not a surface anymore, but you do this famous thing is that when you have two surfaces touching like that, you can draw like that. What you can do is put your finger here and you can actually, you know, cut little discs out around each point and then you can glue them together. But there's a, there's a phase that you have to choose to glue them together. There's a twist and that'll affect the complex structure that you have on the on the domain, but then the map is more or less canonical. You just crush all this down to a point. And so there's an operation from an I family and a J family. You get an I plus J minus D, that's the constraint, plus one, that's the phase family. You have an operation on pairs to that. Now this requires that the points be labeled to do it, and I don't want to label the points, so I'm just going to sum over all possible pairs this operation. So I, did, I take the sum of this operation over all, all possible pairs here and here. And that gives me an operator delta mapping the chains. Well, it's sort of partially defined. Let me, well, let me, let me not worry about that. And it has the, uh, well, on the Well, actually, sorry. Actually, I didn't say it right. Oh, I didn't say it right. This is a special case of what I want to say. For any family, even if it's disconnected, you think of this as a unary uh, operation. So any family, so, so sorry, even if it's dis dis disconnected, you take any pair of distinguished points and you do this uh, operation. So you also do it if the points are in the same component. Then you get a unary uh, operation on these families. It's just a, this is a special kind of family which is consisting of two components, which is the Cartesian product of a family with one and another family with one. It's just special. Now I just apply this to every conceivable family to disconnected surfaces. So you get an operator of degree minus d plus one delta. And uh, so this uses the fact that you're in a manifold. Now this operator uh, is uh, delta is a BV operator. BV, these are the initials of two physicists, Batala and Vilkovitsky, who made an algebraic formalism for perturbative quantum field theory. And what that means is two properties, that delta composed of delta is equal to zero. And the reason for this is uh, that when you choose the phase, there's like a little circle in your parameter. You have some parameters where the intersection happens and then cross with the circle, the choice of phase. And then if you did it again, there'd be some other phase. So you'd, you'd make these two points intersect and then make these two points intersect. And then if you, you could do it, you call the first pair, the first pair, and the second pair, the second pair. You could, this will involve doing the second pair first and then the first pair is the second also in this big sum. And so there'll be another term which is geometrically the same, except the factors will be reversed. And this is orientation reversing, and that will make cancellation. And so delta composed of delta is zero. So that's the proof of that. Uh, and it also satisfies the, this what's called the seven term equation. That if you study how it interacts with this structure here, delta of a times B, you, you try to see whether it's a derivation. Oh, I, I, I forgot to say, uh, delta is a derivation of dot. Namely, you know, Leibniz rule holds. Delta of A times B is delta A times B plus A times delta B with sines. If you, if you study that and try to see whether that's zero, go ahead and subtract off delta of A times B appropriate sign A times delta B, then this isn't zero. It's a two variable quantity uh, function of two variables. 
And the BV operator axiom is that this function of two variables is a derivation in each. Maybe you can put in AA prime and apply this, then B, you get BA times A prime plus BA prime times A. This is a, and if you do BB prime AB times B plus AB prime times B. So the derivation in each coordinate. So in other words, delta is a nilpotent second order derivation. So it's a nilpotent second order derivation. And this is just, you make a drawing like this, you put in two terms, these are the distinguished points. And this is the disjoint union here is the, is the, is the dot, so this is A and this is B. And this proof is just simply, you say, I want to make all possible connections, whether there are three kinds of terms, where I, I, I connect the first factor to itself and then just put in the second, or I connect the second factor and then I have the sum over all possibilities, and then I put the second factor with itself and just put in the first, or I have uh, all the connections between the, the two factors. So this, here's delta of A times B, and here's uh, A times delta of B, and this is what I'm calling A bracket B, and if you try to see whether this is a derivation in H, you have to put in two things. This is like AA prime, this is B. Now I want to do all the connections between this and this. You see there's there are two kinds of terms. It's either I connect to the first one, or I put the second one down, or I connect to the second one. And so that's exactly the statement that it's a, a, a derivation. Okay, so it's obvious. This is totally obvious. Delta squared is zero, and it satisfies uh, this uh, equation. And, and interesting consequences are that uh, uh, some interesting consequences. First of all, that this is a lead bracket. This is uh, an exercise. In other words, given delta squared is zero, and given that the deviation of delta from being a derivation is a derivation in each variable, then this satisfies Jacobi with the right signs. And also delta is a derivation, this is just repeating this again, is a derivation of bracket. Uh, no, no, that, no, sorry, that's not repeating again. Delta is a derivation of bracket. And uh, that follows from this too. And then of course, bracket is a derivation of, of dot. So in other words, the bracket and the so we actually have a structure now. So M has got a lot of structure. It's got the boundary operator, which is a derivation of a commutative ring structure. It's got this operator delta. Delta squared is zero. Actually, it's obvious that, that uh, delta commutes, little delta and big delta commute just by elementary geometry. So the picture zero. So these two commute. Uh, this is a derivation of that. This is a second order derivation of that. And the, and the residue of it not being a derivation is this lead bracket. These two structures are compatible. This is a derivation of that. This is a derivation of that. Anyway, so you have all this algebraic structure. So now when, uh, so this is sort of a, actually it's slightly different from what this is more like an algebraic topology version of what the physicists do with their classical field anyway. So we, this is sort of a differential BB algebra. We'll have delta as well. Okay, so now what's, um, so this is, so like the set of all, you know, string evolutions in space-time, if you it's a big international space. If you look at the chains on it, it has this, this structure, algebraic structure. Okay. Oh, 
I wanted to say just quickly that, you know, so if you can start taking homology in and so on, it, you know, it's not unreasonable that these things are computable. Let me just, just show you that. I mean, if you look at a, a Riemann surface of genus G, as far as the topologist is concerned, it looks like this. I mean, in terms of homotopy theorists, it's uh, a bouquet of 2G circles, and then you attach a 2-cell. Now, if you want to consider all the mass of this into some space X, you just start seeing what happens. So this space, which is M, somehow it's a piece of M. It's a piece of M. Space of all maps of some surface into X is a piece of M. So first of all, you can evaluate it at the base point. So you have an evaluation map to X. In fact, we could, have, if we kept these marked points in here, we could evaluate at all the points and we have a map to the product. And let me not, that will come up a little later. We have a map to the product. And then the fiber would be something, fiber. This, every map in homotopy theory is a vibration. It's a homotopy theoretical fiber. What's the fiber? These are all the maps that map the base point to some fixed point. And so you have the map on this bouquet here. So this fiber maps to a 2G fold product of what's called the loop space of X, base loop space. And then a certain word, namely the product of the commutators, has to be null homotopic. And if you have a homotopy, you can extend it over this disk. And, uh, and then the different ways of extending it will be a map of a two sphere into X, which is called the second loop space. Because it's based, everything is based. So there's a vibration like this. So, you know, with differential forms and so on, you can, you know, algorithmically write down the rational cohomology of these spaces. And then you can try to figure out this vibration, and then try to figure out this vibration, and then take a union over on G and M. So you can actually calculate the, uh, hope to calculate the cohomology of this space, these spaces. There's a little piece of the construction, though. There's another map. There's a map to MGN, which is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And your cycles, families of cycles, uh, or a cycle in this space would also give a cycle in that space. Now, we don't exactly know how to calculate the homology of that. And uh, we have to let the, anyway, we have to, anyway, but one can sort of, dig into this quite far with normal techniques. Anyway, this is an object of study to try to figure out the homology of the moduli spaces themselves. That would be like the theory you would get here if you map to a point. But the X part of it is, is calculable. Then you can try to figure out what this delta operator is. Since it commutes with delta, for example, since it commutes with boundary operator, it passes to homology. So there's this interesting invariant of the manifold in that operator on the homology of this space. Homology only depends on the homotopy type of the space, but this operator uses the geometry a little bit, so it's some kind of characteristic class, maybe. Anyway, so... Uh, okay, I just wanted to say this... This last discussion, he was strongly motivated by a conversation I had with Uli Oshberg in January at Stanford. And, and in fact, when you uh, just want to say that if you if you start doing the manifold with boundary version of this discussion, then you would have this, and then you could think of the boundary as being cross I, and then you would also have these string evolutions in here. So there's a, you know, a, a separate discussion you have to do for this part, and then this part is, so the relative discussion would combine what I'm just talking about and something happening here. And this is exactly what, this, this part here is exactly what this paper is about. So, so string topology is literally, when I gave the title, it just meant this part here. Anyway, so this is, I don't have time to go into the relative part, but this will this figures in, in I think in what Ilya Ashberg is going to say. This is kind of a superficial background structure for his deeper analytical element. And we can see we're going to, now we're going to get a flavor of what that deeper analytical element is. Oh, but first there's a, still a bit of algebra. So what do we learn from uh, the formalism of quantum theory? 
field theory when you have one of these things is uh, uh, one looks one one can there's an interesting equation that one can write which is delta of s plus s bracket s is equal to zero. The delta has uh, you, could, you could look for an, a solution to this equation. S has to have a certain degree, and and this is called a solution of this equation is called a quantum action. And if you have such a thing, then you can also make a a new operator of this sort of what you might call the quantum differential. Which this is so it's delta of y plus s bracket y. So I'm using the two two of the elements of algebraic structure that I have, the delta. And then it turns out d sub s composed with d sub s is zero is implied by this equation. So then you can define the kernel of d sub s modulo the image of d sub s, which is, I don't know, so the s, s cohomology or the quantum, of, is the cohomology associated with quantum action some kind of, and it's the physical states and the observables and so on are expressed in the language of this cohomology, where, the, given, where this is the action that defines the theory. But this is the quantized action after you've sort of formally quantized the theory. Anyway, so this, so this is sort of what we call the quantum cohomology of this space M. So when you have a solution to this equation, so, so we, we don't have a solution. We just have the background to talk about the solution. We sort of have to choose an action and to have a theory that, like this. So that's, but that's just the abstract setting. So now, another speaker at this conference used to be at Stony Brook is Gromoff. And uh, uh, he made this uh, revolutionary breakthrough in 85. And I mean, <laughs> sort of, I mean, in some sense, it's extremely natural from a topological point of view, but he did. Uh, so, so now we have to assume that x is not just any old differentiable manifold, it has to be a symplectic manifold. And I'm going to be pedantic about the, the nature of the choice you have to make here because I listened to this subject for years before I realized that this was the, the point. So anyway, the, the, so the thing is, x, I want x to admit symplectic structures. So that means, it doesn't matter what it means actually, it's just a symplectic structure, some kind of non-degenerate two-form which is closed. But anyway, there's a finite dimensional space of such structures that has components. And so you want to choose, it's like you're choosing an orientation, a manifold you can have two orientations, the more exotic orientations, you can have countably many orientations. This is like an orientation. So you choose a component of the space of symplectic structures on X. So this construction will be you know, well defined, essentially well defined only by the component. There are only countably many components, so this is some kind of really enhanced topological discussion about X. Still topology, you might say. And and then to actually and then to make and then Romov makes a certain construction. For this you actually choose a particular point in this component, a representative of the point, an, an omega, and then uh, and then you also it's just Formal that when you, when you this means you have a symplectic structure in every ve vector space. This implies you can continuously choose a complex structure on every uh, t t t you have a symplectic structure on every tangent space. So you can continuously choose an almost a, a complex structure on each tangent space. It's called the J operator, so it's an almost complex structure. So you can choose uh, this pair, and then you can pick out of this space M of all maps, you can consider the J holomorphic curves. So these are the curves so that smooth maps so that the tangent space, which is a two-plane here, is invariant by J, the J structure that you choose. And uh, 
So, we, so for each n and g, we can have a choice of uh, informal structure. We can, uh, well, let's see. Um, we can do it two ways. We can say the image is a variable by j, but then this is true. We can induce the conformal structure back here. So this, we get a holomorphic map from some complex structure here to some complex to that structure there. So we can think that we're restricting ourselves to the subfamily of maps, which are sort of holomorphic rel relative to the structure that you choose here. This map maps in and respect is respected by j. Now the, the the novelty of this is that this is not an integrable complex structure is not part of some system of coordinates, and yet there's still a good theory because the the uh, uh, equation that this is implicitly defining is a good equation. It's a Fredholm equation, and and so the set of solutions is finite dimensional. And Romoff actually studied the way in which so you get sort of a, you start getting a chain which is non-compact, but he figured out exactly the way in which it's non-compact. And what happens is that you could have a, it's exactly, this algebra that is naturally there is exactly designed to fit with the non-compactness in this finite dimensional space of Gromov. And what happens is that, what can happen is that, uh, little, little next, little necks can form, and this can squeeze down exactly the way I was talking about before. So you, you know, if you fix your genus and your number of marked points, this is so something that could happen. Little necks can form, little necks. And so in fact, if you uh, just think of these two points as being distinct, this, and then put marked points there to re remember that, this is sort of uh, organized by a moduli space of a different genus and n. So the non compact in other words, you have all these different pieces, and the non-compactness of, of one of them is related to the other pieces. This is the whole point. And this is actually, well, so 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 what we do is we're going to define a we're going to define a quantum action, define the Gromov quantum action. So it's going to be a big chain in the space M. And what you do when it's non-compact, and we kind of understand what appears as ideal points through the Gromov's analysis, but what we do is uh, uh, we we'll do something. Now, this is kind of a little bit of a reinterpretation of the standard way of presenting this theory. So uh, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do the compactification algebraically and not explicitly. So. So, so what you do is you define the Gromov action by just choosing a cutoff. This is what the alpha they do in, in quantum theory. They choose a sort of cutoff and then try to prepare things. That's just what we're going to do. You choose a cutoff, and you don't let these necks get any smaller than a certain amount. This can be measured in a conformally invariant way by what's the modulus of an annulus that you can put there. So you keep the necks, keep thick necks you know, next greater than some parameter which you specify in, 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 a, in a natural way. And if you do that, then uh, the, the space of J-holomorphic curves of a given genus and N with control next is compact and you have a compact family. It actually is sort of essentially like a manifold. It has an orientation. And so you actually get, in a natural way, an element in this algebraic <coughs> theory. You have a lot of components one for every G and N. And so let S, uh, I have to make sure I don't make the same mistake. Let's see, uh, you know, let's just take the Romov components uh, which are connected, where this is connected. So let's just take the connected pieces where these two surfaces are connected. So let S be the sum over all the connected GNs of the Gromov space of J-holomorphic curves uh, cut off. So I, I artificially create a boundary by cutting it off. Okay. So that's S. And then the theorem is, anybody guess the theorem? 
but do they can't get the theorems. Anybody else get the theorem? Can anybody else get the theorem? <laughs> no? What? You want to say anything? Satisfy this equation. Right. So that's the so the proposition is that this Gromov S satisfies this equation and uh, Uh, oh no, it doesn't quite satisfy this equation. <laughs> yeah, there's a little point. See, this delta is a derivation, and so, in fact, you, uh, this is called this the new delta. Make a new delta. This is a, a minor change. It's the old delta, the one I defined before, minus the boundary operator. See, the boundary operator is a derivation, so you can add it to a second order derivation, like a first order operator, you can add it to a second order operator and, and you still get a second order operator. So this is still a, a BV operator, translated in this way, and then now it's okay. And the, this new one has the same bracket because it is a derivation, and the bracket, the old and the new bracket are the same because I've added a derivation, so the deviation from being a derivation is zero. So this, is, this part's the same. And I'll just drop the new. Just primary is old, but so that's the proposition. And and this the idea of this equation is due to the physicist Barton Schwabach, and he tried to make a kind of a universal background theory for string theory. I mean, if you, this equation for when x is a point, it's a non-trivial equation when x is a point, and it's Barton is really the I would say the content of a string of papers of his in the 90s that ended with the 96. Uh, and, and the proof is immediate. Because you see the, what is, so what you do is you start calculating the boundary of S. You start calculating the boundary of this chain. Let's take the Gromov chain and let's start calculating its boundary. Uh, I mean, if you didn't have this non-compactness, then this would be a closed manifold and it would be a cycle. So the boundary would be zero. The non-compactness comes from this, this squeezing that can happen. And there are two possibilities when you have a neck. Either the neck uh, uh, separate, let's, I'm, I'm doing, these are all connected things, so everything is connected here. So either the neck separate, either the neck is non-separating or it's separating. So this term here, so actually what I really want to prove then, putting, if this is zero, I put this on the other side, I want to prove the delta of S is the old delta of S plus S bracket S. This is what I want to show. And so there will be boundary terms corresponding to small necks. If two necks are small, that's a lower dimension. So I can forget it. Just one neck is small. That corresponds to the principal faces of the boundary. This neck either separates or it doesn't. So in the non-separating case, it looks like this. And so uh, you have this neck here. And so as this goes in, it shrinks down to this thing. And this has one complex co-dimension less than the dimension of this piece of S. But I've cut the neck off by letting it be like that. So that means I've, I've sort of gone out to the, near the boundary of this co-dimension one thing, and I've cut it off. So here's my boundary that I've created by the cutoff. The phase is this circle that goes around here. And this parameter here is the moduli space for something that looks like this with two points glued together. And you can calculate that if you release this condition, you calculate the dimension of the moduli space. This moduli space is bigger than the moduli space of this by exactly the amount which when you make this constraint happen, makes it appear like this anyway. It's, it fits like this part of the discussion of the So, in other words, this, this 
So this, so this face of the Gromov boundary corresponding to a neck that doesn't separate corresponds to this term, the non-separating neck collar. And this term corresponds to the case when the collar is separating in the surface. So then, so then this thing shrinks down like this, and now you have two independent connected components, and you take all possibilities. So this is like this term here that I had here that corresponds to the bracket where you glue two things together like this. Remember that was the bracket, gluing all terms like this. So the non-separating neck corresponds to this term here. So this is a uh, visual uh, inspection type proof. Okay, so, so that's the formulation of uh, so I, view, so I view this equation as being the analog of the compactification, that when you shift this delta operator, you get a solution. So Gromov gives you a solution of the quantum action, gives you a quantum action, or a solution of this equation. It's called the quantum master equation, DB algebra. So the Gromov cycle of all j holomorphic curves is in this chain language is a quantum action. And so then, so now we can start having fun uh, with this. So now we can, so on this space M, I can, you know, I have the boundary operator, I can do its ordinary homology. That wouldn't be that interesting. It's just some calculable invariant, and potentially calculable invariant of the homotopy type of X. But now we're, uh, Remember already, if we put delta in, we got something that's dependent on the differential structure. Now we're putting S in, and that is something that uses the component O. And then Gromov's uh, beautiful, for me, this is the most beautiful part of all this, actually, is that you know this, this elliptic equation and all that depends on these choices, but it sort of produces an object which is by transversality, which is sort of homological. If you start varying these choices, this object that you produce starts to vary by uh, homology. And so this structure, even though it depends on all the choices, will be well defined up to an appropriate equivalence that's kind of natural in, 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 in uh, topology. So the essential structure, which is called quasi-isomorphism of differential algebras, will be invariant, only depending on the, independent of the choice of J, and because this is a contractible choice given this, and this all can move around in its component. So for co each of the countably many components, you have countably many Gromov actions that distinguish, presumably in some sense, distinguish these components, or tend to give invariance in the components. So then you can, uh, so then we can look at the, uh, you know, the, the A sub S of M star. We have this quantum cohomology <coughs> And this is living up in this big space. It's not in the manifold. It's living up in this big space, which is somehow made out of putting all these loop spaces together. And as I said, you know, you have the genus G and you have n points. You can evaluate, if you have a map of this into X, you can evaluate at these n points and get a map into the what's called the symmetric product of X it's for as many points as you have, because the points are not labeled. And then you can also map to the, the, the moduli space. And so then we can take the ordinary homology of this, and because of this S is kind of an algebraic compactification here, you can put compactification here, too. And the, so, the, so here we have an S as an element in here, because it satisfies ds equals zero. That's what this equation is. And the image down in this theory, this is the usual uh, invariant, which is called a Gromov-Whitman invariant. So Gromov made the construction and written uh, uh, 
said it was like a quantum field theory and found relations. And this is calculating this is when physicists do it for Calabi L manifolds called the A theory. Anyway. So you know, it doesn't matter all that. But, so actually, so I think the so this is a, a different presentation of the uh, of the algebraic topology of the gromov witten invariant. It's a quantum action in this space. And, uh, well, so to get back to dynamics, uh, I mean, j holomorphic curves are can be used to study periodic orbits of flows in space, but they themselves have an extremely rich algebraic structure. This is an, just an example of the absolute case. You go to the relative case that I referred to before, which is, we'll see some of that in Ilya Oshberg's talk. It has an even richer uh, algebraic structure. In fact, this is the one you need to actually go directly to dynamics. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 